Sustainable development was defined by the UN General Assembly in 1987 as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainability is good and important. It seems like a no-brainer. Who would not want to ensure that future generations are able to meet their own needs? Yet, we hear of conflicts every day. Pro-conservation versus pro-development. Climate alarmists versus naysayers. How does sustainability become the subject of conflicts? Yet again, we find that sustainability is seldom at the center of our daily casual conversations and conscious choice making. Why is it challenging to make sustainability center stage? Why is it easier to ignore than to embrace? Let me tell you the story of two mighty rivers in Arunachal Pradesh. The first named Subhansari. In 2003, it was identified as a site for a hydroelectric project with a 2000 megawatt plant, the biggest in India until then. The project came to a halt for eight years due to protests by local communities and environmental groups who asked that the government realistically assess the safety and ecological and economic impact of the project downstream. Several expert committees were formed by governments to investigate these concerns, but the outcomes of their reports varied and were nebulous in, in their approval at best. Now, here's the second river named Dibang and also known as the Brahmaputra in Assam. In 2008, this too was marked for a hydroelectric project, this time with a 3000 megawatt plant, even bigger than Subhansari. This dam would irrevocably alter the ecology of the region, require felling of more than 300,000 trees and disrupt the habitat of endangered wildlife such as elephants, hulag gibbons, clouded leopards, tigers and Himalayan black bears. These are all protected under India's wildlife laws. Work was stalled due to intense opposition from the indigenous tribal community and environmental groups and for lack of environmental permissions. The community stepped down from their resistance after being promised fair compensation for their land. But the power company has now moved court protesting the compensation clause. Cut to 7th February 2021. A flash flood in the Chamoli district of Uttarakhand left at least 70 people dead. The majority of the fatalities were hydroelectric project workers working downstream. Many questions arose around the trigger. The most popular explanation was a glacial lake outburst flood. Lakes are formed when a glacier retreats and the water is dammed in by deposits of soil and rock left by it. If the dam bursts, it can cause widespread flooding and destruction downstream. Another hypothesis, a landslide had triggered the catastrophe. Across varying explanations, there was consensus on these facts. Global warming had caused uncharacteristic events reflected by the increasing number and size of glacial lakes and ecological disruptions had caused lethal instability in the ecosystem. Knowing what you now do, which would you put your weight behind? Renewable hydroelectric energy or a flourishing natural ecosystem and human safety? There are no simple answers here. Let's scale this down. Kaziranga National Park, India's most successful conservation story. This park is now more than twice the size that it was when it first began. From 430 square kilometers in 1974, it has swelled to 914 square kilometers, courtesy additions to the park area. These additions have become necessary as the animal population has grown. With a growing count of rhinos and tigers, its most fetid species. But expansion leads to conflicts between the authorities and the local population. India's Wildlife Act states that there should be no human habitation in a national park, which means that each time the park is expanded, people need to be evicted. Some are forced to leave the very homes that they were born and spent their entire lives in. Indigenous communities living in forests have rights under India's Forest Act, but the court has ruled that Kaziranga has no indigenous forest dwelling communities. Surprising as it may seem, even when it comes to successful conservation, it isn't always a black and white story. 
The decision making is complex and loaded with conflicting rights. A sustainable solution will require immense hard work. Have you ever experienced a sustainability conflict? Recall the last time you boarded a flight. Now, some context. In 2015, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change had met and signed the famous Paris Climate Agreement. In this, the participating countries defined a common target to fight global warming. They agreed to limit the rise in global average temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. This came to be known as the 1.5C goal. Aviation is widely recognized as one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse emissions. In 2018, the International Council for Clean Transportation projected that between 2005 and 2050, commercial aviation operations would reach a 700% increase in carbon dioxide emissions. By 2015, it could take up a quarter of the world's carbon budget or the amount of carbon dioxide emissions permitted to meet the 1.5C goal. Aircrafts are becoming more fuel efficient, but the exponential increase in air traffic outpaces any gains from this. The only real meaningful solution at the moment, less air traffic. Don't fly as much. How does one respond to this concern? Can you shut off air travel and use only surface transport? What happens to your jobs, family visits, vacations? Yet think about it, about what it's doing to the ozone layer and the future of the planet. Then there is the time when you go shopping. You know fully well the issue of the plastic bag. You have seen at least one heartbreaking visual of the plastic litter that we are putting into our oceans, read about how it is damaging our marine life and the health of our oceans and understood that this has a massive cascading impact on global warming. So you might come to a simple solution. Ban plastic bags. Use cloth or paper bags. But Cotton and paper bags require significantly more resources to produce and have a bigger carbon footprint in production than plastic does. At a per bag level, a cloth bag has to be reused at least 100 times to make its carbon footprint comparable to a thin plastic bag. A paper bag, if it is treated as single use, has the deepest carbon footprint. How does one at an individual level deal with these contradictions? The only way to meaningfully reduce your carbon footprint is to reuse, no matter which bag you use, and then to dispose meaningfully. Then there is your food. How do you deal with food waste? Do you know where it goes? What happens not just to the food you leave on your plate, but to all the kitchen refuse that is generated from the food that is prepared for you? Do you know what it does to the future of your planet? Organic waste in landfills generates methane, a potent greenhouse gas. On the other hand, when food waste is composted, methane emissions are significantly reduced, soil quality is enhanced, and chemical fertilizers are eliminated. Why then do such few people compost? Composting is tedious. It requires effort, time, mind space, and consistency. Imagine if you had to compost you do have to focus on your exams and your work life and so many other commitments, right? Imagine if you took a decision to buy food only from establishments which had a demonstrable composting policy. How inconvenient it would be. How would you navigate this knowledge that your consumption choices are linked with methane production which could be significantly reversed with some effort? Let's imagine we have a line between good and bad. There's white and there's black. We know what's what. What is the space in the middle? The space when black starts to look grey and white starts to look grey too. The Oxford Dictionary defines grey area as an area or of, of a subject or situation that is not clear or does not fit into a particular group and is therefore difficult to define or deal with and to judge what is right and what is wrong. That is the issue of sustainability. Like with very many moral arguments, sustainability is viewed as either white or black. You are considered either for or against it. But as you've seen, it operates in gray areas, in the space where forests must be preserved, but renewable energy is critical too, where animals must thrive, but people must too, where air travel is understood to be damaging, but long distance mobility is critical too, 
where plastic bags are damaging, but cloth bags are too. These are conflicting considerations. And if we do not learn to acknowledge and negotiate both ends, we stay locked in cycles of conflict, pitted against each other in ideological silos, ready to look away, be indifferent, consider it somebody else's problem. The solution to engage is to explore the middle ground between this and that. This gray area is where each of one of us needs to find our place and our sustainability strategy. My place on the gray line may not match yours. Given that our circumstances are unique, you get to own your shade of gray between black and white. However, the right to assess your needs and make this choice makes you accountable. It places a demand on you to reflect on whether you are consuming more than you are conserving. It determines your carbon footprint or the amount of carbon dioxide released into the world on account of your activities. I suggest five principles. Remember, do not look away, disregard, forget. When you do this consistently, it becomes a mindset and gets integrated into your life. Reduce. Consider how much you really need. That pair of shoes, that new car, all the new stuff that you have the right to buy with your hard-earned money, they cost a lot more than money. They potentially contribute to costing your future. Reuse. Each time you do, you are reducing your carbon footprint. What cost are you willing to pay for the convenience of single-use disposable products? That disposable face mask, the styrofoam plate, the plastic teacup, are they worth it? Recycle. Be conscious that there is no waste. What you call waste is debris out of your sight. Each tiny bit of waste contributes to mountains of devastation. Reckon. When you do consume, consider whether you are making responsible choices. You can take a stand, even when it's not the most convenient or popular one. As you can see, when it comes to sustainability, nobody has answers for you. You have to do your thinking, reassess your choices, do your homework. Because it isn't easy, very many people look away. But you have the privilege of being able to choose your shade of grey. If you are listening to this talk, then I'm willing to wager you're one of the privileged lot that always have choices. The only question is, are you willing to make the effort to exercise this privilege?